everyone. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Vice President for Europe, Eurasia, and the Arctic here at the Center. And we could not be more delighted than to welcome the Mi Defense Minister of Latvia, Raymond Vejonis, who is with us today, actually uh, here in the United States for the week, uh, meeting with members of the administration, Congress, and visiting our beautiful country, Michigan and Georgia, speaking with uh, U.S. defense officials that have been uh, great participants uh, in, in engaging with Latvian defense forces. Uh, prior to be appointed Minister of Defense in January of 2014, what an auspicious or inauspicious moment to engage in defense issues in, in the Baltic region. The minister previously served as a member of the Strategic Development Commission under the auspices of the uh, Latvian president, has also served uh, a longstanding member of the Latvian Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee and served as chair of the Baltic Affairs Subcommittee, and finally was a member of the National Security Committee. Perhaps, though, uh, Minister Vejonas has uh, is also both hard security and soft security because from 2002 to 2011, Minister Vejonas was the Minister of Environment for the uh, Republic of Latvia. So, as I said, these are uh, critical moments to talk about transatlantic security, defense cooperation, and certainly a great deal of focus on security and defense in the Baltic Sea region. So with your applause, please join me in welcoming Minister Vejonas. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it, it, for me, it's a great pleasure to be here in Washington and uh, the, during my visit, uh, I have possibility to meet also with you and just uh, uh, share my opinion uh, on security issues in the Baltic, Baltic region. 2014 has seen a dramatic uh, change in the European security environment. Uh, Europe has experienced Russia's unacceptable and continuous military aggression in Ukraine and uh, the spread of ISIL uh, in the Middle East. The attacks in Paris and uh, in Copenhagen uh, have commanded a uh, reinforced uh, European response to counter terrorism uh, at its source. Latvia's history has taught us many lessons. Uh, the most important of them is that the democratic values are important not only for ensuring uh, individual freedoms, but also for protecting independence uh, of uh, countries. The willingness uh, to adhere uh, to and preserve uh, these values was the main driving force beho behind uh, our aspirations to become a partners uh, of NATO and EU. Unfortunately, uh, our assumptions that peace in Europe uh, has been assured for a long t uh, time was uh, uh, false. With the Russian aggression in Ukraine, democratic uh, values in Europe are threatened again, and uh, the security situation in Europe uh, is, on a, is on the path of deterioration. Russia's uh, aggressive policy is evolving into more unpredictable um, direction. In the period after September 11, uh, we have been talking about unpredictability uh, of the threats because uh, of their asymmetric uh, nature and dominance of the non-state uh, actors. Now, after the last year, February, uh, I think the situation is even more uh, complicated uh, as before, because we are facing a mix mixture of conventional and unconventional threats uh, used by both uh, state and non-state actors. Therefore, I want to address uh, today several issues important uh, for the Baltic and European uh, security. First of them is uh, Russia. Development in Russia uh, is determined by its uh, own internal uh, dynamics. It has been 
our uh, greatest mistake uh, that we, uh, in this case I mean uh, the West, in general measured uh, Russia in accordance with our own standards. We saw Russia uh, as we wanted to see it, not as it was in reality. Even we, we in, the, in the Baltics started believe uh, in the possibility of positive developments uh, in Russia, despite uh, the fact that Rus uh, Russia's words, words have not uh, corresponded uh, to its uh, deeds. For last five years, we have witnessed increasing, uh, increased military development along uh, our borders. It was more uh, than strange uh, to see growing numbers of military equipment, new bases and offensive exercises and training uh, along the border of strategic uh, partners, as it referred uh, in the NATO-Russia uh, founding act. Four years ago, uh, Russia rebuilt the former a helicopter base just 15 miles uh, from the Latvian eastern border, uh, placing their newest uh, combat uh, helicopters uh, that are more offensive uh, as defensive in nature. But uh, what we failed uh, to recognize uh, is that uh, Russia has been developing uh, into state based on ideology of exclusiveness and the economy uh, that totally depends on its raw materials, especially energy. As a result, there is uh, a requirement to deliver military victories uh, to the Russian public to cover economic uh, gap. Russian aggression in Ukra Ukraine has underlined uh, lined, uh, Russia's willingness to revise post Cold War borders uh, in Europe. It was already the second time in six, six years when uh, Russia has used military force against sovereign nation uh, that used to be a part uh, of the Soviet uh, Union. This indicates uh, that the political mindset in Russia has not uh, changed uh, and even if situation in Ukraine uh, will be uh, sold uh, peacefully, uh, it will uh, likely not uh, change uh, this uh, very mindset. In this light, uh, the latest uh, signals of nuclear threats uh, or blackmailing uh, are particularly uh, worrisome. Russia's aggression in Ukraine most uh, likely was sporadic reaction to the unexpected uh, developments in Ukraine and fall of the pro-Russian uh, regime. This aggression revealed uh, some worrying uh, things. Firstly, apparently the uh, threshold of the use of uh, military force for Russia is uh, very uh, low. Secondly, uh, Russia uh, miscalculated uh, and uh, misjudged uh, the uh, situation on numerous uh, occasions, starting from uh, real support of the Russian-speaking uh, population in eastern Ukraine, ability of Ukrainian government uh, and society to resist, and finally, uh, with the unity of the EU and uh, US positions. This leads uh, us to the conclusion that we uh, have to be careful uh, making assumptions uh, about ability of Russian leadership to assess a real uh, situation and not uh, make uh, misjudgments. Thirdly, and probably the most uh, worrying is the fact uh, that the annexation uh, of Crimea has released uh, the fanatic nationalism uh, in Russian society. As a result, uh, what we see now uh, is Russia with growing nationalism and militarism, Russia which uh, is uh, stuck in uh, Ukra Ukraine. Unfortunately, I have 
to recognize that Russia is our oh, long-term uh, problem as we should not expect uh, any changes, neither in Russian internal uh, developments nor its uh, international behavior, even if the situation uh, in the eastern Ukraine freezes. Therefore, I see two biggest challenges uh, when, when it comes uh, to Russia. First, how to develop our deterrence in a way uh, when it comes, in a way uh, that does not leave the room uh, for misjudgment about our resolve. And secondly, how to develop uh, and consistently implement our long-term policy uh, towards Russia that makes into account uh, our previous mistakes made uh, in the relationship uh, with it. My second point is on the Baltic region. Uh, Latvia and the, and, uh, the Baltic uh, states have quite difficult experience uh, when it comes to Russia's internal developments and how it affects uh, Russia's uh, external behavior. We have learned that Russia can be deterred by several uh, means. Firstly, uh, by our own ability, resilience and determination uh, to fight. Secondly, by allied, especially the US, presence uh, on the territory of the Baltics. And thirdly, by increasing general awareness of possible Russian actions. Only all the, these three uh, components combined uh, can uh, constitute credible deterrence uh, measures in our region. We are glad uh, that uh, the decisions uh, taken in the Wells uh, Summit have given the needed uh, boost uh, to NATO and formulated the right response to the security challenge posted by Russian aggression in U Ukraine. Currently, uh, the all decisions taken in Wells uh, are well on the track, and there is a lot of confidence uh, that uh, by the next uh, NATO summit in Warsaw, uh, mo most of them will be implemented. Development of YGTF is an important initiative, uh, and uh, at this point, it serves uh, uh, as the main deterrence uh, tool based on the rapid uh, reaction capabilities. The work is uh, underway uh, to form the first YGTF uh, under German leadership. Uh, Latvia and other uh, Baltic states will contribute to this force as well. We have uh, committed our forces as well to the UK uh, lead YGTF in 2017. Uh, deployment of the YGTF uh, will be ensured by NATO force integration units or NFIUs uh, that will be developed in six eastern uh, countries. And here, uh, developments are also very prom promising. We have seen work working uh, very intensively since uh, the decision uh, on NFIU were uh, taken this February, and uh, I hope uh, to achieve initial operational capability already this summer. And currently uh, are planning uh, to test NFIU in the exercise uh, this November. Deterrence uh, as a NATO uh, focus should be uh, credible and adjustable uh, to the changing security sit situation. Unfortunately, the security environment uh, since the Wells Summit uh, has not improved, uh, but uh, to contrary, uh, it has the tendency to deteriorate. Therefore, in the mid and long term, uh, I see the need to return to the issue of permanent presence in order to avoid miscalculations and misjudgments, uh, what uh, I already mentioned shortly before. On our side, uh, Latvia has adjusted uh, its defense posture to current uh, security realities and is focusing on rising readiness. 
responsiveness and the early uh, warning. After surviving uh, the major financial uh, crisis and cuts of the defense uh, spending in 2008, uh, we have reversed uh, the declining uh, defense budget trend already for last two years. We have intensified uh, increase of defense budget since June 2014 by uh, adding mid-year uh, supplements uh, for fiscal year 2014 and sustaining this trend uh, for fiscal year 2015. The increase of the defense uh, spending is already budgeted up to 2018 and in accordance with the decision of the parliament to achieve two percent benchmark by 2020. Recently, the government has also reviewed uh, this commitment and pledged to allocate uh, additional financial resources to reach two percent defense spending already by 2018. In line with the National Armed Force, uh, Forces Capability Development Plan, the professional military personnel will increase, reaching uh, 6,000 in 2018. That is uh, increased by 25 uh, persons. Uh, to increase the combat uh, readiness and capabilities of our, uh, our uh, National Guard, uh, its force numbers will be increased and uh, uh, the modernization of equipment is already under the way. And uh, our goal is to prepare 8,000 uh, well-trained guardsmen uh, by 2018. And the de development of high readiness units in the National Guard is already underway. Uh, also, I would like to mention that uh, from this year, the training system of uh, reserve soldiers is also being renewed uh, and preparation underway to introduce boot camps uh, from uh, the, uh, 2016. Uh, thus, uh, retired military personnel and National Guardsmen will go through more intensive res refreshment training, but number of trained persona will be increased uh, through reservist training in uh, boot camps. Altogether, uh, this process is going to build up uh, a well-trained and equipped uh, military personnel up to 17,000 by uh, 2018 uh, from approximately 10,000 uh, current uh, force. Recent uh, changes uh, in the security environment uh, has been taken into consideration in our operational and strategic planning, aiming uh, at the development of increased the readiness and responsiveness of armed forces uh, units. Our aim is uh, to develop capabilities that uh, would be suitable for both mitigating conventional and unconventional uh, threats. Strength, strengthening early warning system and improvements uh, in our air defense system is one of the main priorities uh, at the moment. My third point is about so-called uh, hybrid warfare. After Russian in, uh, invasion in Ukraine, everybody seems to be surprised by the Russian asymmetric tactics employed uh, both in Crimea and later uh, in the eastern Ukraine. Most uh, regrettably, uh, such type of scenario uh, where the state actor, uh, and in this case, the nuclear power, uh, resorted to the unconventional or asymmetric uh, means towards unprepared, not only Ukrainians uh, themselves, but also NATO and uh, the EU. The international system was not prepared uh, to deal with such a, uh, such a case. No, we are again trying uh, to jump uh, into another extreme and uh, making up so-called hybrid scenario as an 
only possible future development. I think we should avoid establishing another buzzword, uh, but rather accepting the fact that the future warfare might be composed of the combination of both conventional and asymmetric tactics employed by state and non-state uh, actors. I have to admit that uh, what happened in Ukraine was not uh, totally a surprise for us. In our contingency planning, we have expected that Russia most likely would resort to uh, the asymmetric means in order to make it difficult to activate Article uh, 5 of the Washington Treaty. What was a sur surprise for us was the cynicism and cruelty of Russian leadership uh, covering Russian military engagement in Ukraine. Additionally, we in Latvia uh, have, be, uh, have been experiencing Russia's hybrid warfare for decades, and it's, uh, it is not new for us. Russia has been uh, trying to prevent integration pr process in Latvia since the beginning to affect the minds um, of our people and spread uh, disbelief in the country by increasing propaganda, financing different NGO, and in many other ways. Therefore, when I have been asked about possibility of hybrid warfare in Latvia, I always uh, respond that we have been in this warfare uh, already long before. Since uh, then term, hybrid warfare has been dominated uh, the news, uh, but uh, however, the concept itself uh, is not new. History is uh, literate with examples where actors uh, have utilized a combined range of hybrid uh, methods to achieve their goals, like in Greek, Greek uh, myth uh, mythology, the Greeks fam famously used a Trojan horse uh, to outwit their opponents uh, in the siege of uh, Troy. In the Peloponnesian uh, War, the Athenians uh, chose not to engage Sparta in a decisive and land battle, but chose more uh, protracted methods of resistance. If you look open Latvia's own recent history, we too uh, find a significant hybrid uh, theme. Prior to the Soviet occupation of Latvia in 1940, the Soviets had been conducting shaping operations throughout uh, the late 20s and 30s. Uh, the Latvian Soviet Friendship Society, for example, uh, through the Soviet Embassy in Riga, sought uh, to build a positive image of communism and actively appealed to the left-leaning uh, intelligentsia in uh, Latvia. And as a matter uh, of fact, uh, throughout uh, the history of the 20th century, the Soviet Union used temp uh, template uh, puppet people, uh, republics, as a way towards loyal uh, local government. The Soviets uh, have tried to install puppet government uh, and establish Latvian People Republic in 1919, but uh, were defeated uh, by Latvian uh, forces as well as uh, on many other occasions. The difference between then and now is that uh, the Soviet Union used communism uh, ideology uh, no, Russia used ethnic ideology as a base for puppet uh, people republics. We have some historical experience uh, dealing with such threats, and we are uh, ready to hand them again if such necessity will arise. Once I was asked uh, what you are going to do if a little uh, little green man appears uh, on the streets of our towns. Uh, my response was, uh, we will shoot uh, them. It is clear, it is clear that uh, hybrid threats can work when there is uh, ambiguity uh, on preparedness and lack of awareness. We try to eliminate all these factors. 
even uh, tow hybrid uh, threats are not new. We have seen actors take advantage of technological innovation and the 21st century information space to create an increasingly complex type of hybrid uh, threats. In Ukraine, we have seen Russia's doctrine of Maskirovka uh, played out uh, in uh, the 21st uh, century hybrid times. In the military space, we witnessed uh, a, a unique blend of conventional and irregular power. Special force units operating without insignia acted as uh, forward instruments to disrupt uh, Ukrainian state control, influence local actors, and coordinate or even create insurgent uh, units. In eastern Ukraine, this was backed up by conventional cross-border art artillery support and regular force uh, deployment. In the informational space, uh, we saw a substantial propaganda campaign uh, to create ambiguity in uh, Russia's actions uh, and generate a narrative to undermine uh, the legitimacy of the Ukrainian uh, government. This propaganda portrays uh, US as the main reason for all the bad that happens uh, to Ukraine and, and Russia. Also, the rest of Western countries are to blame for the situation according uh, to Russian uh, media. However, uh, we also need to keep in mind that Russia is trying to develop good uh, relations with countries that heavily rely on it uh, economically. The strategic aim of uh, the, the strategic aim is, of course, to divide Europe and uh, NATO in order to make them incapable uh, of taking any decisions uh, against, against Russia. Finally, in the cyberspace, um, open source reports uh, indicated a mix of cyber uh, espionage techniques against Ukraine. Ukraine decision makers combined with attacks on Ukrainian government websites in order to disrupt uh, Ukrainians' uh, ability to communicate with the domestic uh, audience uh, and uh, further impact uh, on Ukrainian political uh, credibility. This evolution of hybrid threats is not, of course, limited to Europe's uh, eastern flank, uh, but can also be seen in the south uh, through the actions of I ISIL. Whilst uh, ISIL has seized geographic territory and fields uh, a semi-conventional force, their roots uh, lie in uh, asymmetry. They are glued together by a toxic ideology uh, which uh, they seek to export through careful manipulation of the information uh, environment, use terrorism, and fear to control the population uh, center uh, that uh, they hold, draw from a complex criminal uh, financing network, and have shown signs of activity in the cyber realm. As regards uh, the Western response uh, to hybrid threats, we have ex experienced a rather good and coordinated uh, action by the EU and uh, NATO. This response has uh, underlined uh, the natural division of labor between these two organizations. NATO has shown its capability as hard power deterrent, uh, while uh, the EU has used its uh, wide range of soft power uh, instruments. Regarding the process uh, in the EU, we are trying to use our status as, as a presidency of the EU Council as much as possible to enhance Union's response to hybrid threats. This issue has been has been discussed among EU defense ministers, and we came to conclusion that there is a need to explore 
options for comprehensive uh, EU action. We expect that the heads of states and the government, governments in June will give a task to come up with concrete uh, proposals by the end of this year. The most important element of the response, however, is to increase uh, cooperation among member states, EU institutions with international actors, especially NATO and uh, the US. Summing up, I see that there are uh, three main points uh, what are important in dealing with high hybrid threats. Firstly, ambiguity is a key to the success of hybrid uh, warfare because uh, it sets doubts and questions uh, attribution. Secondly, awareness of the problem, awareness of vulnerabilities and problems is only way how to remove ambiguity. Thirdly, strategic communication is important as it, ca uh, uh, as it can save the hearts and minds of our, our people uh, from being uh, uh, con uh, uh, concurred uh, by our enemies long before we enter military uh, phases of the conflict. Uh, today, we live in times that, uh, that uh, are full of challenges and unprecedented uh, situation, but uh, never, uh, nevertheless, we in Latvia and Baltics are glad to be a part uh, of the democratic and value-based group of countries and together with uh, world, world's most important uh, state uh, actor, actors. However, uh, a lot needs to be done uh, to preserve this stat status quo, and uh, this is, I think, exact time to put the most effort uh, to, to doing uh, so. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just put... No, I just, okay. Mr. Minister, thank you so much. We really appreciated your comments. Why don't I have you, actually, why don't I have you sit over there? We'll do a little set change here. Thank you so much. They were great, comprehensive remarks. What we thought we'd do is I, we'll do a little bit of a conversation between us, and then I'll leave, I'll leave plenty of time for questions from our audience. As a, a long-serving member of, of the Latvian parliament, can you help, help us understand what is the mood of the Latvian people? Is there watching this, how they're absorbing the strategic communications. Um, help help see, set the scene here for us. What, what's the mood of the Latvian people as they're watching events unfold over the last 14, 16 months? Uh, the reality is quite scared because normally when you have uh, parties at home, uh, together with family members, together with friends, uh, one of the key topics during discussions near the table is war. Will Russia attack Latvia? Will be the same situation like in Ukraine? And of course, it's one of the key topics of that. Uh, it is the reason why, from my point as a Minister of Defense and the Ministry and the Ministry of Defense, we are trying uh, to do the best uh, how to prevent uh, and deter any military, possible military aggression. And uh, we are doing a lot. We are strengthening our armed, armed forces. Uh, we are uh, strengthening our cooperation with our partner, partners, uh, especially uh, with the US. And it is the reason why I'm now uh, here in, in Washington. Washington. Uh, but uh, the key, key point of us, and it's also uh, give a, a quite uh, good understanding of situation, is that uh, the NATO forces uh, are visible on our soil. I think it's one of the key points uh, that uh, the NATO forces must be 
in the in the Baltics. In the Baltics, it gives uh, us uh, really strong support, not only for society that we are not alone, but we are together with our partners. But also, I think it's strong signal uh, to Russia that uh, uh, NATO uh, members uh, together will act according to paragraph number five if uh, such uh, necessity will arise. And that, that moves perfectly into a question about sort of maintaining NATO alliance solidarity. I think all of us were struck at the Whale Summit last September. Yeah. Very strong messages, very unified, uh, and very, you know, very clear plans on the readiness action plan. You mentioned the. It, it wasn't so easy during the summertime it, it, before, yeah. before Well Summit. That's right. No, that there, and you're absolutely right. There were some questions about that. But as time lengthens, as this crisis continues, um, what's your sense on alliance solidarity? It's difficult to see when President Putin visits Budapest and Prime Minister Orban when Greek Prime Minister Tsipras visits Moscow. We know sanctions are not fully supported. That's an important part. Speak to me about alliance solidarity. And then uh, to move into the question of, I think our political leaders need to practice decision making in an asymmetrical hybrid warfare. Your point about a lot of the actions that we're seeing just come below the threshold. The other day, we saw that uh, Russian Deputy Prime Minister Dmitry Rogozin visited Svalbard, quite unannounced, uh, to the surprise of the Norwegian government. You know, these these efforts are meant to shake confidence, erode credibility. Help help us understand, in some ways, both alliance solidarity and then practicing how do we make decisions in this unclear environment. Uh, Russia uh, use uh, already known. Uh, technologies, how to influence uh, other countries. From one point, they always use economical instruments like gas, and for example, Latvia is uh, dependent 100 uh, on uh, Ru Russian gas. Uh, but in the same time, uh, Russia use instruments, these economical instruments to divide uh, the country's opinions in smaller groups, and it is the reason why Hungary is a little bit uh, out of main mainstream of uh, of the countries. Uh, Greece with economical pro problems, Cyprus with uh, Russian investments in banking sector. Uh, it means that uh, try to to divide uh, opinion. And it means that uh, if we will be divided, we will be weak, and uh, uh, Russian, uh, uh, Russian, uh, Russia will be more, more, more stronger. But uh, speaking about uh, solidarity, yes, before World Summit, uh, we had a lot of discussions, and we really worried uh, about uh, the outcome of World Summit. But during the World Summit, all NATO countries, all leaders of uh, NATO countries uh, were in a, uh, one voice uh, and we made these very important decisions. What the situ situation, I agree, the situation is not changed, it's uh, just a little bit freeze uh, in Ukraine, but uh, we see that uh, this uh, Present situation in Ukraine uh, helps uh, to strengthen uh, solidarity of uh, NATO. Because if the US was the first country, and we really thank uh, to the US for very quick response when after, after, after the annexation of Crimea and uh, US uh, soldiers was on our soil, just one year ago, uh, since la last last April, and uh, no any other country may be ready uh, to send uh, last year uh, more soldiers to the region. No, the situation is changed, and uh, many countries on rotational base uh, are sending troops. Norway, Germany, uh, and other countries. It means that. Uh, this frozen situation strengthens uh, the solidarity of NATO, NATO countries. 
Fantastic. I want to, looking ahead down the calendar, we have some important dates ahead of us, certainly May 8th and May 9th. Um, are you concerned about any uh, provocative actions that could be taken around both those dates, obviously the 70th anniversary? Uh, of, of course, we are preparing for possible uh, provocations uh, during, uh, during the 9th of May uh, because uh, the, uh, the special, special meeting uh, on the 70th anniversary of uh, Victory Day uh, will be held in, in, uh, in Riga and also in other places in Latvia. But, uh, but uh, we have such uh, hist history. It's really uh, difficult uh, and sometimes quite bloody history of our country because uh, through, through different wars, we was involved in different armies, uh, not voluntary. Uh, and of course, we have the soldiers who was, uh, who was a soldiers in Soviet army, who was uh, so, so soldiers, or in uh, in in in, uh, in uh, fascistic German army, and uh, it's it's part of, of our history. Nothing, nothing to do, but but uh, but we are not so much w worry about this situation uh, because sometimes. Uh, through the propaganda is trying to use uh, Russian speaking uh, population of our country. But I can say that uh, the, the real ethnic uh, Russians who born, uh, lived, uh, and still live in our country, they, they are loyal uh, to the state. We have only small part, uh, really, uh, a few few more proactive, uh, pro uh, pro-Moscow or oriented persons who maybe are uh, trying uh, to provoke uh, or uh, are trying uh, to pro uh, pro uh, make some provocations against uh, the government, but, uh, but it's just few, few persons. Uh, we, we had social sur survey, survey among uh, Russian-speaking uh, population, and the results was uh, quite uh, surprise. Like uh, non-citizens, we have about uh, 250,000 non-citizens. Uh, about one third of them uh, will be ready uh, to, uh, to, to fight against uh, any uh, possible military aggression with armors on hand. Wow. Uh, and the Russian-speaking population, more, more, about 50% are ready to do the same. It means that uh, our Russian-speaking uh, population is ready also to protect, uh, to protect uh, of our country. Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Nader. One last question before I turn it over to the audience. You mentioned about defense spending, and clearly one of the, the outcomes of the NATO Wales Summit was getting all NATO members to 2% of GDP. You said you're, yeah. you're on track. The 2018 budget has been defined and on track. Yet Estonian President uh, Ilves has been encouraging his Lithuanian and Latvian colleagues uh, to, to do more to get there faster. Are there any plans to try to return to Parliament, seek more support for enhancing and meeting that 2% two percent commitment before 2020? Uh, yes, I mentioned it on my speech that uh, in the government we decided uh, that we want to reach 2% of GDP by 2018. And we are on, it, on, on this track. Despite uh, that uh, economical situation in Latvia and in Europe is slowed down and uh, it's little, little bit stagnated, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, first time, uh, the first time in, in, in the government, our main priority is security. Yeah. External and internal security, because we are uh, speaking not only for strengthening our armed forces, we are speaking about strengthening our borders, strengthening uh, pol police, poli po policy uh, police uh, of country. It means that uh, 
we, we are uh, thinking on both directions and doing. Great, thank you. I'm sure we have lots of questions from our audience. What we'll do, Mr. Minister, with your permission, is we'll bundle a few of those questions. If you could please raise your hand, identify yourself, and speak very clearly into that microphone. Sometimes it's a little difficult for us to pick up. So I have one question here, and uh, the second question, Jill, and then the third one we'll take there. Thank you, Carl. Hi, Minister. My name is Anya Grigas. I'm of Lithuanian origin, and I'm a scholar of the region. I have a question to what extent you're worried about some of the, not quite military action, but uh, some of uh, Russian engagement of the, of the citizens. Particularly, I'm talking about uh, the camps Russia hosts, um, the like, um, paramilitary camps for youth, uh, like the Soyuz camp that was done in Kyrgyzstan last summer, and various such activities, so basically, uh, milit providing military training for the youth. So, and of course, this is a very small percentage, but, but still it's a type of uh, activity for society. Yes, we have some small such, act such activities, uh, but uh, now we are uh, evaluating possible changes in our legislation, how to uh, prevent such situations, uh, to totally avoid such situations, and. Uh, this year we will uh, make changes in, in the law. But uh, normally, uh, from our side, we propose uh, to our use, uh, use another uh, possibilities. We have use guards uh, under the uh, Ministry of Defense and its special voluntary organization where, where uh, any school children uh, starting from 10 years uh, to be a part of use guards, they they, they, uh, they learn our history, history of army. Uh, we train them to survive, survive uh, in, in nature, and of course give so, some, some military knowledge, uh, like uh, this ma ma marching during uh, the, the parades or so on. It means that we give some, some small knowledge. Great, Jill. Thank you, Jill Doherty from the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, you know, <laughs> I was struck very much that almost everything you said depicted a situation which is very undefined, hybrid threats, how Mr. Putin, I, you didn't use his name, but I presume that's who you were referring to, uh, assesses the situation, et cetera. And I had two questions on that. You said that um, the leadership you know, there's, it's questionable whether, if I understood it correctly, can correctly assess the situation. Do you believe that President Putin um, does not understand really what is going on? Or is it that he dissembles, gives the impression that he doesn't precisely um, act in a uh, um, premeditated way? And then the second question would be, I thought a very interesting point. How do you uh, guarantee security without triggering a response that you might not intend? In other words, how do you actually protect yourself from these uh, undefined threats without giving signals that are undefined that could be misinterpreted and lead to conflict? Thank you. Of course, I'm sure that Putin uh, understand what he what he is doing uh, together with uh, his partners. But uh, here, here we must return back on uh, Russian history because uh, we must speak about centers of gra gravity uh, of Russia, why they are doing so. And uh, in history, we saw a lot of examples, uh, examples why Russia did in some way, the same way in dif different uh, different times. It's uh, Russian chauvinism, it's uh, socialism ideas, it's uh, this, uh, like uh, Russia is uh, the s strongest and uh, country, uh, country in the world, and so on. It's uh, this uh, Rus Russian world, uh, and so on, it means, a lot of a lot of uh, dif different examples, and it's nothing new. They just continue uh, uh, continue the same things what they did 
uh, during the Tsar time or during the Second, Second World War or du during the socialism when also Latvia was a part of uh, so Soviet Union. It's, it no, no changes. They want to keep uh, their geopolitical interests in the post-Soviet post uh, territories, uh, but we are, we are 14, okay, together with Russia, 15, 15 independent sovereign uh, countries, and without uh, real military aggression, it's impossible to get a power in, in these countries. It is the reason why they tried and started war in Georgia, no uh, Ukraine, they have impact uh, in other countries like in Moldova, Transnistria uh, region and so on. It's, it's, it's a, a mechanism how to keep uh, still pressure on, on these countries. And the uh, sec second question was about, uh, sorry. It's sort of escalation dominance. Okay. So okay. If, as you're preparing yourself to deter mm -hmm. hybrid yeah. threats, does a signal to Moscow is that this is going to be an escalatory yeah, yeah, yeah. issue? Uh, for, for, for us, is uh, ahead. We, uh, after, after the uh, situation escalation in Ukraine, uh, we evaluate, first of all, all internal procedures, how we can react on different uh, conventional, unconventional uh, threats, including hybrid threats, and of course, our in internal procedures uh, for our armed for forces has changed, and uh, according, uh, according to this evaluation, and time to time, we have common exercises uh, with our partners from Ministry of Interior, uh, with uh, border control and so on, uh, like a play scenario with uh, green, green men, how all uh, will react to, to such a uh, situation. But in the same time, the mo uh, more important is that uh, we need uh, to establish very good early warning system, because for any uh, military case, we need information from intelligence, from other, other sources, uh, because we can proactive make decisions, especially when we speak about paragraph number five, uh, before paragraph number five, if paragraph number four, uh, we, we can start uh, consultations uh, within NATO about possible changes uh, in security in the region. And it, and it could be a decision that uh, the YGTF, for example, will arrive more quicker uh, because the situation could be uh, could be escalated. S secondly, uh, I already mentioned it, that we strengthen our armed forces to be ready for different situations, and of course we are uh, developing uh, new capabilities in our army. And third point uh, is. Uh, we really need uh, visible NATO presence in the region. It is a reason why in all auditories we are speaking that uh, uh, we need this presence not only on rotational base, it's, of course it's very good uh, also that uh, uh, different uh, exercises is very good, but in the same time, we are speaking about permanent uh, pre uh, presence of NATO forces in the region. Because if any situation will escalate, it, if NATO forces will be on place, the reaction time always will be more quicker than according to all, all uh, internal uh, NATO, NATO, NATO procedures. And it means it, all these three factors together make this deterrence effect uh, against any country. And I, I believe that uh, if we will do the best uh, on these three directions, uh, nobody uh, will want uh, to, start, to start escalation uh, against uh, independent country. Well, Mr. Minister, thank you so much. We understand you're seeing Secretary Carter on Thursday. You have some other important meetings uh, uh, in Congress, uh, but also looking forward to the June NATO Defense Ministerial. Well, we'll continue to see where there's progress on that. And we're, we're absolutely divided that a very clear 
Latvian voice message of commitment, uh, not only to defense spending, but to deterrence. It will be loudly heard. So we thank you for spending this hour with us. And please join me in thanking the minister for his comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.